Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Ranting Pedagogues podcast. My name is Rachel, and I'm a fellow in VT Great. Um, VT Great is the Graduate Academy for Teaching Excellence. We're a group of diverse uh, fields and individuals dedicate to, dedicated to all things teaching. Um, if you're interested in joining the conversation or um, checking us out, we'll have links in the description. Um, before we begin, I would like to mention that the opinions stated in this podcast are not a reflection or representation of Virginia Tech, VT Great, or any other student organization. Um, they're our own opinions. So um, now that that disclaimer is out of the way, I'd like to introduce our guest today, um, Isaac Presgrove. Isaac is a first year PhD student in mechanical engineering working in the TREC lab. He pursued, or he's pursuing his PhD after he completed his bachelor's in mechanical engineering at Purdue University. He worked at General Motors for four years and then received his master's at VT, working in the robotics and Robotics and Megatronics I'm lab. I'm sorry, I had a moment of like, I can't read. <laughs> Robotics and Mega Megatronics Lab. In the midst of this, he's been involved in numerous leadership and teaching roles that range from teaching new Boy Scouts how to start fires, I'm assured in the most safe manner, um, serving as, one on, on, as a one-on-one -on -one tutor during undergrad, and then holding multiple GTA and instructor of record positions here at Tech. He's participating in graduate student governance and is passionate about improving community along graduate students and building relationships in and out of the classroom. So with that, welcome Isaac. Thanks. Um, I would like to start by talking about your aspirations. Um, my understanding is that you wanna go into academia after all of this. So um, could you tell us about that and how did you get to that goal or get to that conclusion? Sure. So when I was an undergrad, I uh, thought that I wanted to be a professor. I don't really know what sort of like struck me to to believe that I wanted to be a professor right off the bat. Maybe it's I have a long history of like sort of family being teachers, mm -hmm. but I knew I didn't want to like teach high schoolers or younger. I figured that would probably not go well for me. Um, Is there a reason? I swear too much. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Somebody would go home and tell their parent what uh, Mr. Presgrave had said in class today, and I'm sure that that would have not gone over. Yeah. Um, but around my senior year, um, life sort of became a little bit messy and I ended up sort of just defaulting to what I thought was the uh, sort of like thing you're supposed to do, right? Which at the time seemed like as a uh, graduating engineer, get a job. And so even though I still wanted to go to graduate school and uh, pursue academia and become a professor, I ended up going and working at GM for four years, um, which was a good experience. Uh, I learned a lot there. Among that, I sort of learned that if I wanted to do the style of work that I wanted, which is like mostly technical, I really wanted to get back to like actually having equations in mm -hmm. my like daily engineering challenges, um, that I needed to go back to graduate school. And so I came back and I, when I came back, my uh, aspiration was still to become a professor and stay within academia. But uh, first two years of my master's here, I was, I came in right in the middle of COVID. So it was sort of like a rough intro to academia and um, there's some other sort of like rough bits and I so I, I wavered back and forth a lot in between whether or not I wanted to stay in academia and become a professor it seemed like a very like muddy path forward um, that I wasn't sure that I was like confident enough to, to pursue um, but I, I decided that it, you know at least I wanted to get my PhD like I came here with the goal I was gonna get my PhD I was gonna stick it out and, and do that but I ended up switching labs for that in this past year um, I've been in my new lab, the, the Trek lab, like you mentioned, um, and it's been a much smoother experience. Um, it's a it's a much different side of academia that I was seeing in my master's. Um, sort of just one because we're not in COVID any longer, right? Like, I there's a lot more like socializing and like everything feels better now. Yes. Um, but also I've gotten the chance to do a little bit more interaction with students through some sort of like more involved GTA roles, and then even greater beyond that with the instructor of record. And that really affirmed for me that I still had that passion for teaching and involvement with students. Um, and I didn't, I can't really see anywhere else where I would get to both have that involvement with students uh, and like in the classroom and do sort of like the, the technical work I wanted to I enjoy. So now I've, I've once again sort of landed back on, I want to stay in academia. I'd like to become a professor. Um, and that's, that's currently the path forward. No, it's nice that it came kind of full circle and that even though you had external um, experiences or um, maybe negative experiences, that still rings true to that 
you are still passionate about the core of like the work, which is teaching and then getting to do research on the side. Yeah. Um, I think a lot as like GTAs and um, we kind of brought up the point uh, earlier that um, sometimes depending on your department or your field, like teaching isn't necessarily put first, like your research comes first and then your um, like teaching duties come like after. Do you think that that's how that is um, in the mechanical engineering department? Like it's obviously like first things first, get your research done and then, you know, you can just be whatever type of TA you need to be to get through it. Yeah, so I think that's really dependent lab to lab um, and sort of like who your advisor is, whether or not they are pushing you that like your research must be done at all costs um, and sort of like, because I have heard stories of that where like there are some advisors that have said that like, you look, your GTA role isn't actually a responsibility. I understand that like you contractually are supposed to be doing this, but like what I need you to do right now is your research and I'm your advisor and that's how it's going to be. Um, I have not experienced that personally. Um, I've had a lot of freedom in sort of balancing my schedule in between research, TAing, extracurricular activities, you know, what have you. Um, so for me, it's been very much a, a self-guided balance of like how much time do I need to put into this particular GTA role versus like how much do I need to be dedicating to my research uh, to make my own progress forward. And um, it's my understanding you brought up how you went out of your way to try and get instructor of record roles. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and the process of doing that and um, maybe like vaguely touch, I guess that's such a vague question, but if you could touch on like your experience with that and like, sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I, like I said, when I came back into to grad school, I already had an idea that I wanted some involvement in teaching. Um, I got offered as part of my acceptance to Virginia Tech, a one year contract to be a GTA where I, I ended up TAing for um, the ME Senior Design course, which uh, is, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity that I, like, I had a GTA position. That's a lot of what, like, made my decision to come to tech over anywhere else is that I was offered funding. But the, the Senior Design GTA position doesn't have a whole lot of student interaction as part of it, mm. um, especially during COVID where we were completely virtual. All the Senior Design teams were virtual. Um, so I'm mostly, with the exception of, like, a few emails and then attending grand total of like 16 presentations, I think across the entire year. Um, I didn't have any direct interaction with students. Um, and so that really pushed me to try and find uh, TA roles where I would have greater interaction. It also worked out that like my contract ran out at the end of the year and I was um, sort of just madly searching for anybody who would pay me regardless of what they were gonna pay me to do. Um, and that led me into the chemical, uh, chem not even chemical engineering, just the chemistry department here. Um, where I was a TA for 1045 and 1046, the, the freshman chem labs. Um, and in those, you're, you know, you're a lab instructor. So you have a lot of face-to-face -face interaction with the students. Um, and it's not quite uh, teaching yet, since you are sort of just like leading the lab. You're all the materials set for you. And really, uh, you don't, somebody might dislike me for this, but you only really have to know chemistry to run the lab, right? Like you just have to know how to read the manual better than a freshman. Yes, I was um, just about to bring up how, so I, I work in the chem department, so I've, I've also TA'd this class before. And um, it's it's bad that I'm gonna say this, but sometimes it can be glorified babysitting to the point where like, you just gotta make sure that they don't get hurt during lab. Like there's no accidents, no nothing. Like get yeah. through the lab unscathed. And like, that's the goal sometimes, or at least at the first, part of it like for sure that's what you have to have to do because it's a lot of running around with your head cut off at first but yeah then you get get under the ropes so anyway yes you don't really need a strong chemistry background to do all that yeah and it's also so it was it was nice to like have that step closer to being an instructor and like having a little bit more responsibility and a lot more interaction with students um, but it still wasn't like really fulfilling that role that i wanted um and so I had asked around in the ME department if anybody had been an instructor of record before. Uh, one of my friends had, when he joined Virginia Tech for graduate school, he'd been an undergrad here, and when he transitioned to graduate school, his advisor had sort of like offered him a deal where he would be on GRA the entire time he was gonna pay for his research, but like as part of that, if he wanted, he could have a semester where he taught, um, I think it was, it was either fluid or thermo that he ended up teaching. Um, that's how he had gotten into it. And we knew of one or two other students who had gotten instructor of record roles within the department, but they had also been on sort of like 
odds and ends deals where it was like maybe a graduating or close to graduating PhD student and the, the advisor had set something up very specifically for them um, as like they were contracted as a GTA, but they were mostly running the course and the advisor was sort of just stepping in when needed so that they had that teaching experience to put on the resume, but nobody had um, had really, there was no clear path, right? Like every, every path to instructor of record I heard about was sort of these like weird one-offs, like, well, I did it this way and I got it that way. Um, and mine was similar actually, because I, I happened to be talking with one of the undergraduate advisors um, in the ME okay. department one day. And she mentioned that the professor who usually taught controls over the summer uh, was trying to get out of that role. Like he, he had other things that he needed to be doing that summer. And so there might be an opening. And I hadn't expressed that I wanted to teach yet, but I was like, oh, well that's perfect. Your alley. Yeah. And so I just started like wandering around, like talking to various faculty within uh, the department. So I, I reached out to that instructor specifically, or that professor, and I said like, hey, I, I hear that you don't necessarily want to teach over the summer. I feel like I'm qualified to teach the controls course and I, I have an interest in teaching. Like, is that okay with you if I was to try and pick that up? And he was like, yeah, that's, I'm all for it. Uh, you should probably talk to these people. And so I went and talked to a couple of the faculty and admin. I was like, let me teach. Um, and they said, uh, sure, I guess. Um, <laughs> and so I ended up uh, teaching over the summer. And for me, I was actually, it's kind of weird because I you're not on GTA when you teach over the summer. If you're not enrolled in classes, you are technically an adjunct faculty. Um, so for six weeks, I was employed by Virginia Tech as an adjunct faculty to teach controls, uh, which is its own like special world of weird. Because when you're a GTA, right, you get a you get a contract and you get paid yes. regularly. Yes. As an adjunct, no one told me how much I was going to get paid before I came in. They're like they kept mentioning they're like, yeah, we'll pay you like the normal amount for like three or four credit hours because it was like a four credit hour class. But technically, I wasn't coming to the lab. And they're like, we'll give you some money that's like equivalent for that. And I was like. How much is that? And they're like, meh, some. Hand wave. I was like, is it enough to cover my rent? And they're like, yeah, yeah, you'll be fine. I was like, all right, I will, you know, I'll live and I'll deal with this. And it wasn't until like a couple weeks into the class where I was talking to my friend who was actually serving as my GTA for the course. Mm -hmm. And he's like, hey, when did you get paid? Because I got my check and like, I have a contract. And I was like, oh, that's weird. I don't have a contract. He's like, maybe you should look into that. And I was like, maybe I should. Um, so I ended up like talking, I like emailed some people like, I am going to get paid, right? And could you please put that number in writing? And so I got an email back that's like, yes, you will get paid. It is this number. And I was like, all right, cool. And they're like, we're just going to pay you at the end because that's how we do adjunct faculty. Um, so that was its own little like experience. And like teaching in the summer is also its whole thing because you take what should be like a 15 week course and you just mash it down into six weeks. And oh my like a hell of an experience for like your first time around, right? Yeah. Um, but I, so I had done that and then sort of the, the same semester, so the, the spring before that summer, I had also found out that another um, professor was going to be on sabbatical this year. So he's currently still on sabbatical. Um, and he ran the mechatronics course, which I was interested in teaching as well. And so like sort of around the same time I was emailing the controls instructor, I also emailed the mechatronics instructor and so sort of ran the same gamut with him where it was like, Hey, I hear you're not going to be here. I want to teach a class. I think I'm qualified. Like he knew me. I'd been in this class before. Um, and he said, yeah, sounds great to me. And so I, you know, I ran through the same loop of people and I was like, let me teach. Um, and they were like, maybe probably it's not the summer. We sort of really want an actual faculty, a real person to teach this. And I was like, well, okay, fair enough. But like, please. <laughs> um, and it, it worked out where they're for a while. They thought they were going to have, like one of the current faculty take it and that current faculty was like i really really don't want to do this please don't make me and so they quit trying to force him to do it and they just handed it to me but i didn't find out until like a week before class started and they're like surprise you're actually like full on the instructor now um wow so how is that trying to get a class ready to go in basically like a week two weeks max thankfully i had had i had been talking with the previous instructor for mechatronics before so i had all of his um like all not not even just his but like the years prior to him as well material um already handed to me so i i it was not too bad putting it together but i did pretty much every single week i was restructuring slides like the day of class and like showing up having just made a fresh slide deck um, but it wasn't i wasn't creating a lot of new material i was sort of just like reorganizing and shuffling what i had um i don't know it was an experience it was fun <laughs> I love how you explain it as like, it was fun. 
I mean, because that could be very stressful. Um, to I'm sure it was stressful in the moment. But, yeah. Um, Mechatronics is nice because like, like controls is core curriculum. Okay. You have to teach them this. Like yeah. if they don't know some of this material, there's going to be like some big gaps that may like come back to bite them later. Mechatronics is only taken by seniors. They don't like technically need to know anything. Like everything you teach them is gravy, right? Like yeah. it's just extra on top. And so I, I really like, I kept falling back on that mindset where it's like, if I don't get to this in the class or if I don't, like hit every little detail of this, they won't know because they don't know yes. what they know. Yes. Um, and it won't like it won't negatively impact them leaving the class. Like they're gonna leave this class knowing more than they came into it with, and that's that's the goal. That's what we're aiming for, especially to like my first time through it and everything. Um, so that helped really like manage the stress level a lot. Do you think you prefer uh, that style of? like course where it's, you know, maybe later on, like junior seniors, you know, it's all of it is gravy, or do you kind of also like teaching introductory, like um, younger students as well? Like, do you have a preference over one or the other at the moment? Um, my preference is not so much like whether or not it's, it's later or earlier as much as it is sort of my like comfort level with the material. Okay. With controls, I've taken a lot more courses in controls than like because it's a it was a junior level class I think it's like a three thousand and so it's their first time hitting controls ever. Um, mm. Whereas like I've taken controls, I don't know how many times at this point. And like I, I use it in research and I've applied it, and so like I'm very comfortable with controls. The knowledge gap above them was like pretty substantial. Gotcha. Right, like it'd be hard for somebody in that class to ask me a question I didn't know, and so I felt very confident. And like I will cover all of this material. And like it's pretty easy for me to know what is and isn't going to be a gap for you if like you don't get it. Um, and that, so like, I, I prefer sort of like living in that comfort of like having that big overhead in knowledge, whereas mechatronics, I knew a lot of it better than they did. Um, but like the amount, like that overhead on top of them was in some places a lot slimmer than I was comfortable with. Like we talked about MOSFETs, which is transistors, it's like some electrical components. Okay. Um, that's fine. And like, <laughs> I know what MOSFETs are and like, I mostly know how they work, but I'm not a double E. I've never had to like actually do design with MOSFETs. I've only ever dealt with like the idealized version of them and I've never used them in real life. And so like the day that we had to like cover MOSFETs in the curriculum, I was just like, this is MOSFETs, here's some graphs. I can explain these things to you. Please, please, please don't ask me any questions about this. <laughs> I had tell them that, but like, you know, you're, you're running on like a much slimmer margin and they don't know how like thick or slim that margin is. And that, that can be stressful some days. So I guess my, it's very interesting that way because with it being slimmed out, like, is it okay to admit to a student, like, I don't have the answer. Like, I'll look into that for you. Like, do you feel comfortable saying that? Absolutely. Because I, I feel like that humility is like what kind of needs to happen at those upper level classes. It's like, yeah. I'm at the top of this, but at the same time, like, I can't know everything. You can't know everything, but like, I'll look into it for you. Yeah. And having that dynamic with students. Absolutely. I think that helps build like really good relationships in the classroom too, where if, like sometimes it's nice. Yeah. That if you walk into class and you feel like your professor knows everything and they're just like this godlike being that hands down knowledge to you. But yeah. especially like as you get, or as the students get closer to the end of their degree, I think it's, it's nice to, to get the sense that you like, you're approaching, like you as a student are approaching uh, competency, right? Like you're at a point where you can ask really good questions that might stretch the knowledge of your instructor on occasion. And then it's also good to know that, like you said, like, you know, sometimes you just don't know. And like modeling a good way of like handling not knowing something is also, I think, a really important teaching moment that instructors get to have. Yes. I think it's very similar to like if you make a mistake also, like modeling how, OK, I made this mistake. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm going to like find where I made that mistake and then move forward from it or like change my thought process on how to solve the problem. Yeah. I feel like it's like two sides of the same coin type ish. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I actually, I got a couple of feed, like some feedback on my spot surveys that was like, cause I, I made a couple of mistakes in class where there was like, I straight up taught the wrong equation one day where I just like, I wrote it wrong on the board and I did the whole lecture and I kept looking at it through the lecture. I was like, something's not right. Like I can feel that like something's off. Um, 
And then I had students trying to do the homework and they all came to office hours and they're like, how, why? This is where, like, you know, something isn't lining up. And so yeah. like the next day I came into lecture, I was like, all right, so we're just gonna forget everything that I talked to you about on Tuesday and we're gonna redo it because I was wrong. And like, here's, we're gonna talk about why I was wrong and here's how it was. And I got feedback about that, like specific incidents where they're like, it was really helpful to like have a professor one, acknowledge that they were wrong, and then, like, two, reteach it and, like, take the time to make sure that, like, the understanding was corrected, as opposed to, like, sometimes even when professors admit they're wrong, it's very, like, hand wavy. They're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Here's the right thing. Way. Yeah. yeah. Like, you don't need to, like, we're not going to dwell on the fact that I was wrong. We're just going <laughs> to... No. So. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that... I'm glad you took the time. Like, that, that initiative, I feel like, is not... Sometimes that initiative isn't there, like mm -hmm. you just said. And, like, even with GTAs, like, that's not there sometimes to be like the best teacher that you can be which is unfortunate because we are the sometimes we are the only instructor that like yeah. students interact with and I feel like for me personally like that makes me want to be the best teacher for them and like have the positive interaction because they might never interact with somebody as closely as they do with like a TA yeah you know versus unless until you get up to the upper levels and then there's maybe like 15 20 people in the class and then right um whatnot but I mean that can really like that can set your expectations right for like what is sometimes it's hard to like get, if you don't have a relationship with your professor and you don't feel like you're doing well in the class it's very easy to get lost and yes. just be like well, nobody cares. Nobody's really going to stop and help me. And so if you don't have the GTA, you know, an interaction with the GTA or somebody else similar who can, like, teach and guide you, it's really easy for students to get to, like, burnt out and just, you know, like, they're, most students are capable of success, if not all students are, like, given the right opportunities, yes. are going to get, like, you know, are going to succeed and, like, do quite well. But if you don't feel like anyone's, like, supporting you or, like, pushing you towards the right opportunities, um, it can, it's really easy to just, like, drop out and get left behind. Yes. I think um, something we talked about when we were having a conversation earlier this week, we were saying how um, often, like, a part of teaching is being an emotional support system for your students, and it's not something that's, like, necessarily talked about or, like, brought up. Like, hey, these things are going to happen. Students are going to come to you with, like, needing help for certain situations or needing an, an extension because this thing happened in their life. Um, and so being able to have that relationship and trust with your student and teacher yeah. and then having them be able to like come to you is, is something that it's unfortunate that like some students don't feel comfortable doing that to, with their TAs depending on the relationship that they have. But um, yeah. where I was going to go with that is incentivizing like being a good TA. Like, it's unfortunate that it doesn't feel like everybody feels incentivized to do so. Yeah. Um, and it, a part of the conversation that we had earlier was, how do we do that? Like, how do we kind of ask, like, TAs and instructors alike to be better instructors and teachers? But we're already doing so much. So, like, how do we make that happen? Yeah. Um, which is kind of what I like to talk about. But... Um, yeah, I think that that's, it's sort of difficult, right? Like you touched on, it's it's hard to just straight up ask somebody to be better, right? Especially if we're talking about GTAs in the context of like Virginia Tech, where almost everybody who's a GTA is already like a little strapped for time. Yeah. Um, and it can feel overwhelming for someone to be like, hey, I know you're like fulfilling your GTA roles, your duties as they're written on paper, but like, could you do more? It's like, uh, sure, could you pay me more? And the, the answer is always no for that. And so like, it can be very difficult to sort of intrinsically incentivize that. And I think some of that comes from like, what has been modeled for GTAs and instructors previously. Um, I know for me, I've had a lot of like really good instructors and, and role models for that, like that empathetic teaching style and like empathetic, like leadership and stuff like that, where there's a lot of understandings sort are of, like baked in and that is like I've really enjoyed those and like taking those as role models and like sort of tried to integrate it into what I do. Um, for example, the the professor who taught mechatronics, he has baked into the syllabus that like there are six late days for the entire class. Just like off the bat, you know, if you need the like if you fall behind or like something comes up, you just don't want to turn in an assignment one day. Like it's already there for you that you can like you have that sort of like free empathy to you can you can turn in assignments late. And he also has it like written into the syllabus and I, I kept that when I rewrote and like distributed the syllabus that like 
if you find yourself running out of late days or you're in a situation where like late days aren't going to cover it or you just something else comes up like the policies here are not set in stone like it's not a you follow these or nothing it is a these are the majority like we i expect this to cover almost all of you but should one of you fall outside of this please come talk to me and like we'll work it out and he was really good at modeling that during covid when he taught the class because it was all online and it was the i think the first time that mechatronics had ever been taught online uh and it was just like the class was a little bit of a mess and he was really good about like you know if he got behind in the lectures he would move due dates to to match where we were in the class as opposed to like penalizing students and if students came to him and were like stuff's wild right now like i need to you know can we just push that assignment out he would do it for like one student or if like a bunch came and asked he was very good about like announcing to the class like hey i've, I've had this feedback um we're just going to change it we're just going to make it better for everybody um and i tried to keep that when i taught the class as well it was like you know if you have i i started like the first lecture where i sort of went through all that and i was like these are the policies for the majority should you find yourself outside of this come talk to me before you just decide that you've you know, falling behind or need to drop the class or whatever. And a few, like, there are a few instances where that worked really well. I had a couple students approach me and they're like, one of them had his laptop die in the middle of the semester. And he's like, I, I've done all these things. Like, I've already tried to get it fixed. Um, IT is told, is working on it. I won't have it for a week. I cannot do, like, I don't have a computer. I can't do any of this without my computer. And I was like, all right. <laughs> <clears throat> We're just going to have to, like, I ended up skipping a lab for him. And I was just like, I just we won't grade it we won't count it towards your final grade um you know we're we'll figure out some sort of like makeup assignment so you still get the learning that would have been part of it but you know it needed some like serious adjusting to to accommodate his situation um and then i had a couple other students who approached me about like much more minor things like hey can i have another day here or, like i'm you know doing this thing can i get off for that and i said yeah sure um, and then i had another student who came to me like two-thirds of the way through the semester and was like failing horribly. I hadn't noticed he was, I hadn't been doing um, most of the grade entry the GTAs had. Um, and they, they let me know, there's like, there's, there's a student who's like missed a few assignments. And I was like, oh, that's odd. And they're like, what do we do if somebody turns an assignment 13 days late? And I was like, you what? <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to like, I ended up reaching out to the student. I was like, yo, what are you doing exactly? Cause this is, you know, this is wild and you haven't come talk to me and I'm looking at your grade and you are, you are, failing my class almost to the point of like not being able to recover from it let's talk yeah no it is unfortunate when like students they think like oh i've got this i've got this i've got this i'm gonna get back on track like i'm gonna do it myself like there's a there's a point where like you can't do it yourself like you need to ask for help and it's like in those moments like no please come to me like i can help you or i will try my damnedest to help you yeah um but don't be, don't shy away from that. Like, I, I need to know, you know, you can't just like hide from, from it forever. Yeah. That was really the, that was the conversation I ended up having to have with them. And it was, it was a, it was like both a very stressful and like interesting teaching moment. Cause he was sort of like, I, I asked him about it and he's like, oh yeah, I'm aware of this. And I was like, and you're, what are you doing about it? And he's like, I just don't want to ask for help. That's sort of like what the culture I've been brought up in. And like, I don't expect to get help from like professors and stuff. And it's just like, all right, well, here's the deal, man. Like I'm offering you a line. You can take it or not. That's, I mean, at yeah. the end of the day, it's up to you, but like, you are not going to make it out of this class. If you, if you don't take this line. Um, and I, we ran through a whole bunch of stuff. It's sort of like a story in and of itself. Um, getting him back to where he could actually pass the class. But, you know, like, how do you teach a GTA back to, like, the original point? Like, how do you teach a GTA or an instructor to do that if no one has, like, modeled that for them? Especially if, like, a lot of, I think, the people who end up in grad school and as instructors in college were good students, right? Like, yeah. what's the percentage of students that had interactions like that kid mm -hmm. and, like, really got to see the impact that an instructor who cares can have like what percentage of those students make it to a position to then return that favor to somebody else? And I think that's part of a lot of like, like why you don't see more GTAs and more instructors sort of like naturally including that is because they haven't experienced the benefit of it. It's just like, it doesn't occur to them that that's a thing that's necessary. Mm. No, I completely, completely agree with you. Cause, um, something worth mentioning is like, you know, like encouragement, like you don't realize like, 
giving that kid a line. Like, that could have changed his entire, you know, future. Like, he could have just been like, oh, like, I'm failing at this class. Like, my worth is not there anymore. Like, I don't deserve to be here. I'm just going to drop out. And then here that person is maybe like two, three years later and like, or whenever, and yeah. they actually graduate and they're like, wow, like you changed my life. And it was just one conversation. It was like one interaction where you had empathy, you had like patience and you're like, I'm going to help you. And, or, you know, I'm going to encourage wow. you because I want to see you succeed. And like having that energy I mean, I, I don't think a lot of TAs think about the fact that they have a profound impact on the students that they interact with, even if it's just a minor, minor role, you yeah. know, um, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to be encouraging. It doesn't hurt to be positive. Um, yeah, it can. The flip side of that, though, is like, it really can be frustrating, right? Like if you, yes. if you help a student out and then that nothing changes and you find yourself helping them out again and again, and it happens, and maybe it like happens with more than one student. Like it can very quickly. And I've talked to a couple of other, uh, my friends in the department who've, who've TA'd and they've been in courses that are sort of like notorious for uh, like cheating and failing students. And mm. like, it's really easy to get a, like a very jaded view of like students and what they're, you know, what benefit you can really have on them. Um, Cause I've, I've had some conversations where they're like, yeah, students have just gotten lazier or they expect more and it's like i don't personally believe that i think sort of every generation is pretty much just as good as the last it's just like the struggles that the next generation sees are different than the first and it's really easy to like minimize struggles you didn't experience yourself mm -hmm. um and so and when you're not sort of putting those struggles on an equal playing field it can be very easy to like get jaded when they ask you silly things or someone abuses the system and you don't see any consequences for the abuse of the system and you don't see a lot of like positive return for your energy in. Yeah, I think it like um, the pandemic really kind of put it in perspective of like changing how people teach and then also kind of changing that energy of it. Like, you know, being empathetic and sympathetic towards like situations that happen and then moving forward from that or like, being more active in class because seeing how being online and teaching lectures and straight lectures were not just like, it wasn't it, like, you know? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, <clears throat> students that have been, uh, like this wave of students that we're actively teaching right now, it's like they bring something completely different to the table because like their expectations of like teaching might be different because they dealt with two plus years of like teaching that necessarily wasn't like up to snuff or like, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you go through enough classes where like your instructor doesn't even know how to get zoom turned on and like mutes themselves halfway through and like, or just like recorded lectures are just ass. Yes. Like <laughs> I know people who love recorded lectures. They'll like listen to them on two X speed and like that. They just absorb information out of that. Like crazy. I hate it. I can't do it. I've never once, every time I've skipped a class, I've been like, I will watch the recorded lecture later. It's not going to happen. No. Nope. That's, I'm nope. 100% not coming back to this. I never skipped classes in undergrad because I was like, I'm, I'm never going to look back at this. Like, if I'm not in class, I'm not going to be actively participating and that's just what it is. So I couldn't even imagine. By the time the pandemic hit, I was already really out of classes or phasing out of classes for my yeah. grad degree. So it was nice that like I wasn't having to deal with that, but having to put a lab class all online was like insane. Like yeah. it was like very much, like by the end of the class period, normally when you're teaching lab classes, like maybe they get a general understanding of how to do like, you know, synthetic technique or like they can add things to the conversation or understand how acid-base chemistry works. Sure. But like by the end of that remote learning, like trying to do lab, classes online like there was none of that like yeah. nothing um and you can kind of see that sometimes with like research like undergrad research mm -hmm. now um which is fine though because like at the end of the day like okay so this this kind of got missed out on but it's nothing that we can't get you where you need to be now yeah um and i think that's like an initiative a lot of teachers gtas like me personally like mentoring like I understand that like we've all went through that so like let me get you where you need to be before you need to graduate type vibe yeah um that's not like that's not a little bit of work 
right? No. Like getting getting no. students, especially if they come in having sort of already been turned off to the idea of traditional lecturing, right? Because over Zoom, traditional lecturing, which like might have worked before, um, at least reasonably well, like really broke down. Like I, I got a lot out of lecture when I was an undergrad. I was very similar to you. Like I attended pretty much every lecture because that was where I learned the best. Yeah. But man, Zoom just sort of killed it. And there was like, you didn't feel like you were interacting with the teacher. The teacher didn't feel like they were interacting with you. Because mm -hmm. um, the class I taught over the summer was all virtual through Zoom. So that was lovely. Um, but like, I could totally see how if you had like the past two years were just a very broken stream of traditional lectures. When you get to like in-person traditional lectures, you don't have, or maybe you've forgotten how to make traditional lectures useful for you. And like, that goes both ways for both. Like as a teacher, you've forgotten how to make it because you've just, you've gotten used to the blank Zoom screens and the like black void that you've been talking into for two years. Yes. And students have gotten used to like sitting quietly and not talking up. That was one of the things I was, that was, that was a big learning moment for me over the summer is I constantly was asking my students, like, do you understand this? Like, do you like, everybody's like, got this, like, are we clear? Um, and like trying to like prompt questions and I almost never got anything. Like I would like the few students that had their cameras on, I would see like nod and then crickets. That's it. <laughs> um, and I remember like as an undergrad, like you would have, if you had a professor who was asking that, there was almost always like a general like murmur at least through the classroom where it was like, yeah, 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 yeah or like somebody would raise their hand and be like, actually, what was that? Yes. <laughs> and you would go back and there was just, there was none of that. And I asked them at the end of the semester, I had a, my last lecture, I, I was like, all right, we're not going to do anything today. Like everybody just come in, your, your final's already through, but I want you guys all to attend if you're willing and we're going to like talk over the class and like maybe do a little bit of like here and there material that we missed. Um, one of the things I talked to them about, I was like, why is it that none of you ever responded during class? And they were just like, she's not used to it. Like it's been two years of like, no one, like the, the instructors really didn't respond. And like, you know, you like they would miss if you put questions in chat, like you just didn't get answers and stuff. Yeah. And so they like, it's just been baked out of them. They're just like, the, what, what was, what's the point of answering questions? And I sort of had the same, I had a similar experience when I taught in person, it was a lot better. People would mm -hmm. sort of like respond, but you could see the difference in the classroom from like when I was a student versus like, them as seniors were like, it was really common for people to be trying to do other things in class. Like everyone's got their computer up and you can't tell people not to have their computer up. Cause like, you know, maybe they're taking notes, maybe they're doing something, I don't know. It's their, their prerogative, right? They showed up. So I'm, I'm happy right. for that. But like there were kids that would do CAD in my class. <laughs> um, and then like some people would ask questions, but like a lot of the times I'd stop. And even though it was in person and I could look at them, they would just be like, yep. And unless you like point at them, like you, <laughs> answer the question you just didn't get any feedback um i recently like this past semester in office hours at the beginning um a lot of well i have like repeat people that come to office hours so at yeah. the beginning it's like they don't want to talk to me they don't want to interact with me um and i do so the class that i ta normally it's it's called 10 chem 10 14 and so i'm in class with them so they see me in class they know who i am so they shouldn't necessarily feel like they can't talk to me. But at the beginning, they won't really ask me questions. And I'm like, well, I'm going to sit here until you have a question. So like, I yeah. need you to ask me questions. But at the end of it, I, I, I kind of steered away from like saying, do you have any questions and put it more towards, I'm going to take two questions before like we leave. I mm -hmm. need two questions. Somebody needs to ask me two questions. And they kind of got in the habit of like, oh, that problem that you did, I didn't really catch this or that, or like they, or maybe they'd ask like general questions about the class and that's totally fine too. Yeah. But like it got them interacting with me, which, you know, I found out that somebody didn't know how to do long division, like by hand, like, and I, nice. I was like, yes, it was a very yikes moment. And, but it was one of those that I like took a beat and then I was like, okay, let's do it. Like, yeah. let's work it out because we don't use calculators for like the first exam or I think it is uh, maybe the first two exams. So that could have like really been a problem for the student because they didn't know how to do long division. Yeah. Um, and it's like, you don't know what someone doesn't know until that moment presents itself. And then it's like, okay, we're jumping in. Like, let's, let's do it. But yeah. the interaction is so important. And that's, I, you bring up a really good point of like 
how you phrase, like, or how you prompt them yes. to give it. And, like, if you leave it as an option, it's really easy for people to sort You're of like, just, like, oh. yeah, just... <laughs> <laughs> Unless they have like a really truly burning question, or they're like one of the like sort of exceptions to the rule, yeah. but the, making the requirements, and I, I like that. I will probably keep that going forward. But I think that's something that's it's been lost is like or isn't taught. I don't even know if it's lost as much as no one ever. You either like you you figure it out on your own, or like you model it after somebody else's, which I'm gonna do now. Um, yeah. <laughs> or like you just don't have it. Yes. Or it's like even if you try and like you have all the intention in the world of like having students interact with you and like learning what they don't know uh it just doesn't happen sometimes yeah no i i holistically believe that like the community that you create in the classroom is going to like make teaching easier make learning easier like that is a, that is a very obvious thing right if you yeah. have like a good environment positive encouraging environment like your students are going to thrive you're going to thrive as a teacher. Um, yeah. So I put like a very large emphasis on trying to make it like a welcoming and like open space of like, yeah, it's okay. Like, it's okay if you don't know that, like you shouldn't feel embarrassed being like, Hey, I didn't understand any of that because it's like, okay, let's, let's go at it a different way. Or like, let's, you know, kind of tweak how we're teaching to better accommodate someone's learning level without being like, okay, take me back to like, you know square one because you don't need to go back to square one with most students like you yeah. can probably meet them halfway and get them to where they need to be um which something you mentioned in like your application for this is that you kind of tailor how your approach is depending on you know like what you've seen as best practices like through your experience but also i'm assuming as like you know as students open up to you more like kind yeah. of gauging what they could use or what you need to use in order to get the message across to them um, is there any like specific examples of that, like that have been great or like, how do, may, I guess maybe your thought process and like your experience, like how you go about that? Yeah. So I actually, I, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm really intentional about when I'm instructor of record, like so much so that on the first day of class, I will assign a quiz to my students. And like, one of the questions is how do you learn best? Um, and then I also, I didn't do it when I taught controls. I don't think, but I ended up doing it for the mechatronics class, and this is another thing like I'm stealing from previous instructors of mine, which is I, I asked them, you know, what what do you want to learn? Or, like, what do you think you're going to get out of this class exactly? Um, and I, I was really intentional about that with mechatronics because there are a lot of students that come in, they're like, they think they're going to learn one thing or like do something, and like they want and end goal out of this class because it's, it's optional, right? Like you took it with some intention, you didn't just have to be here. Um, so I was really, I made sure to like, what, um, you know, what do you want to get out of this class? What do you, how do you want to learn that? And then I think I had another question. I didn't make that the last one mandatory. I don't think any of these were mandatory. I just asked people to, I had them all write it down. When in, in Mechatronics, I just had them all write it down at the end of class. I was like, we're having a pop quiz. Uh, you can put your name on it or not. I don't care. You just like, I need these answers from you guys so I can instruct better. Um, and then one of the things was like, what what hobbies are you into like what do you do um and so my reasoning behind all this question is like first especially for a class like mechatronics where you can be there because you want to be there not because mm -hmm. you have to be there is like i don't want somebody at the start of the class to think that they're gonna like walk out of here understanding how to um like program the next mars mission because it's just not what we're teaching um and a lot of students are like, I want to be able to build a robot by the end of this class. And I was like, good luck. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's close to what we're teaching, but like, we're not going to get there. And then a lot of students is really a common answer. So like, I, I came back in the day after that and I, I sort of like clarified, I was like, I read to let them know one that I'd read all of their responses. I was like, here's what I heard from you guys. And like, sort of like repeated back what the quizzes had said about like, some people want this, some people want that, some people da 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 da. Some of these we're gonna to get to. I was like, some of these you will learn. Others of these are not in the purview of this class. I like they are great things. I can tell you where to find resources, but they are just not what I'm gonna teach you here. And I need you to know that and not be frustrated. When it doesn't happen. Yeah, when it doesn't happen. <laughs> and then lots of students responded the same way for like how they learn best. Almost everybody's like, I want examples and I want hands-on, yes. which like they're engineers, so I could have written those two answers myself. Um, and then like a couple people uh, made requests like, 
if you put the slide deck up before class, it's really helpful for me because then I can like write my notes and follow along with what you're doing. Um, there was another one that was, I had like another one that was like a, a one off or like one or two off. Um, I forget what it was now, but it was something to do with like how I did the slides. Um, and so I, I let them know like I had heard those things and like I was gonna do my best as possible um, to do it. And then the last one I asked about hobbies not because I care what they're doing with their lives. Um, <laughs> but I assume but, it's for examples. Yeah, like exactly. Like relating it back to real life. It is. It's, I, I tend to, when I explain things in any context, like in class or out of class, I really like taking a concept and then pulling it out of its, like, its home and, like, rehoming it in some, like, something that people are more familiar with. Um, for my class, thankfully, like mechanical engineers, cars work really well. Um, so I can like rehome a lot of concept in like cars and like I can give a lot of like tangible, like real world examples of like what we're learning in automotive applications. But like I had a couple of people who were like, I really like baking. Um, and I was like, all right, sick. I also like baking, so this works out for me. Um, and you can like, you can take some of the concepts. It's not as easy like one to one it, but you can like, you can pull them out and be like, this is like, you know, if you think about it, if you think about this concept sort of in this way, you are doing the same thing. We just don't talk about it like that within like the context of like baking or whatever your hobby is. And I think for me, that's helped. And I've had a lot of like experiences with um, like friends who don't do engineering and like trying to explain engineering concepts to them mm. and like others through other things. Um, that's sort of like where I've picked that up. And so I, I make sure at the start of the class that I like I, one, hear from them what's, like, how I need to do that, and then, two, that I let them know that they've been heard, which is sort of one of the things that I try and do to, like, encourage them. Like, your feedback is, it at the very least, it's going to get read. I will do my best to, like, follow up on it and follow it, but, like, at the very least, you will know that, like, every time I ask you for feedback, I'm going to read it. Um, this is, I, I just want to say, like, this is great. Like, I, I want to applaud you on this because I feel like if more teachers did this, it would be... And I think some some teachers do, and maybe depending on the class, like examples and being interactive can be a lot or more difficult. But I do think that this is such an important thing. Um, and specifically speaking to like diversity, equity, and inclusion, like yeah, like the class that I'm a large part of teaching is like a very diverse class. Like they're from everywhere. They have a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different ethnicities. Like. They're, you know, languages. Like, mm -hmm. we talk about languages and money all the time because a, lot, a big portion of what we do is dimensional analysis. Mm -hmm. And all that is is converting from one thing to the next thing, right? Yeah. And we can do that with language. We can do that with money. But, like, to speaking in a language, which is hobbies or, you know, things that people, that are tangible to people, is, like, a very big technique in science communication. Mm -hmm. Like, you, if you can explain, you know, what your research is by, or a concept using something as simple as, like, beads on a necklace or things that are like common knowledge to common people yeah. like that can make all the difference like you don't have to use jargon or things that are just high above people's like learning level yeah just to get the point across um and i i wish more teachers did that or like kind of rephrased it and rehomed these topics because that makes it significantly easier for someone to be like oh i remember when you know he said this and this relates to that and i actually have to use this equation instead of that equation or whatever thought process like spider web thinking yeah. they have to go through to get to it but relating it to real life is just such a i feel like it's an underrated like yeah you know concept of doing doing so um, well, i had a conversation actually recently whereas um it was in regards to like engineering communication or science communication mm -hmm. um and a lot of times you'll see the phrase like explain it like a five-year-old Yes. Or explain like I'm five, right? And like it's constantly talked about. It's it's a really common phrase to be like, you know a concept when you can explain it to a five-year-old. Yes. And I think that that's sort of misleading, right? Like because it, it, it encourages you to dumb down the topic as opposed to like explaining it differently. Because like I could explain to you how a car works, right? Like you might not understand the like the intricacies of like variable valve timing and like how like intake runners and like the exhaust and how all that like makes it yeah, yeah, yeah. good 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 this is the face i'm looking for <laughs> yeah right but like i can dumb it down and be like spinny thing go round make other spinny thing go round therefore car move forward it's like okay. you're five you understand that spinny yeah. thing spinny thing go forward done but Simple. do you actually understand how a car works no. exactly <laughs> so like 
I think that that's the, it's sort of like the trap of explain like I'm five. And really it should be like, exp, I don't know what the nice shorthand for it is, but it should be like about rehoming the topic in something that they are more comfortable and like knowledgeable in as opposed to trying to like simplify it down to like a five-year-old's level. No, I, I definitely, I hadn't really ever thought about that phrase being... I never really thought about it that way because I'll talk to chemists, other chemists in my department who will speak over like my knowledge level about a specific thing they're doing. Like no one in the, no one in the department's doing the same thing that you're doing. Like you can't assume that anyone knows like so niche what you're doing. Yeah. And so I'll commonly say like, talk to me like I'm five or like talk to me like I don't know anything mm -hmm. because then it requires them to like take out all the jargon, take out all like the very niche thinking and rephrase it in a way that like someone that knows base level at yeah. the end of the day someone that knows like broadly chemistry and like can talk to you about it and then take me deeper yeah. um but yeah maybe maybe that's kind of what we need to do like rehoming it rephrasing it in common language instead of kind of instead of not like... explaining it thoroughly you can explain something thoroughly without um watering it down so much that it loses its meaning yeah, the difference between, like, explain it like I don't know anything and explain it like I know everything about this different topic. Um, yeah. No, you're, yeah. It's the curse of knowledge. We talk about that. We have, like, an introductory course to, like, how to be a grad student. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they talk about that all the time. And uh, I guess in science communication as well, like, the curse of knowledge. Like, no one knows as much as you do. Don't make any assumptions. Yeah. Like, you can ask them what their background is. Ask them, oh, do you know what this is? If they say yes or no, then, like, th there you go. That's how you have to, you know, steer the conversation. But, um, yeah, like, with with teaching, it can't, I feel like it can't be understood enough that, like, rehoming, rephrasing things is, is the way to kind of do it and make it so that it matters to the person. Because they don't realize what matters to them, like, their first, second year. Like, they don't, we... In the class, we do dimensional analysis, as I said, and yeah. I do that every single day of my life. I do it in my lab notebook. I'm constantly like, if I have this much reactant, how much product do I need? Or am I going to get out? Or like, how much of this other reagent do I need? Yeah. And to them, that doesn't matter. To like chemistry majors at the beginning of all it, it doesn't matter to them. They're like, okay, I have this number, I have that number, and I get this number out. But like, the reality of it is, is like we're teaching them very like basic skills that like if they go into this field, they're going to need to know. So yeah. making it applicable to like them in real time in that moment is so important. And realizing that like professionals do this, like, yeah, you know, we do this every day. Like this isn't just we're teaching this to you for, you know, shits and giggles. Like we're not. This, this actually matters. And like reforming that so that people actually pay attention is yeah, it's the it's the like it's the cursed question that everybody who's ever been in a high school classroom before has heard of like when am I ever going to use this? Yes. Uh, and it's like you there's a lot of ways you can answer when am I going to use this, right? Like the answer could be on the test next week. Um, which is fine and but the the problem is that, like that only motivates the student up until that test and yes. then that knowledge is no longer worthwhile. Out, um, out in one out the other. Yeah, and so like anytime when you're like, you know, on this test in this class next semester um, it, where it's just like another deadline for them to meet pass and then they can get rid of it. It sort of like falls out of their brain very quickly. Whereas like, if you do what you're saying, you, you sort of put it in a context that is like immediately salient to them, right? It's not like, oh, you'll need it at this future date and time. You're like, well, you may or you may not like actually need this later, but I'm going to teach it to you in a way that is like relevant to you right now in this instant. And so like, yeah, maybe you do need to know how to do calculus later. Maybe you'll be an English major and you like won't ever hit calculus again. Maybe English majors do calculus. I probably shouldn't say that, but I don't know. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag sim. Um, <laughs> but you know, like if you put it in, it's as opposed to being like you'll need it later. Being like, well, I don't know, but for sure this makes sense to you now. I think is, is way more productive. Yeah, I've been in like in leadership and instructor roles since I was in high school. Yeah. Early, early high school. I was going to say, when you brought up about Boy Scouts, I was like, wow, that must have been your first leadership role. Would you say so? Yeah. One of um, teaching the, I was 
I was trying to think if I had anything before that. I don't think I did, because that would have been either late middle school or like first year of high school or so that I became like a leader within the within Boy Scouts or within the, the troop. And that's that's always entertaining. Because I, I got put in charge of like teaching them how to light fires, um, which is a it's a required skill for like their first camp out. Um, and that was some of like my earliest experience running a classroom effectively, right? Because yeah. you get this group of about eight uh, fifth graders um, and you have to teach them how to start a fire, which was a skill that I knew sort of like inside and out. I like read what the Boy Scout manual said about it. And then I'd also like, I grew up camping and so I was, I could do well, it. Right out. Um, and that was, it's hilarious how like that parallels um, sort of teaching now and like much different because then it's like you, it was about a two hour thing you know you teach them right. how to you walk them through like the basics like here's sort of the theory behind it here's how we're going to apply that theory and then all right go do, do the it. lab section you know like go start it and one of my favorite parts about teaching it was that every year the problems were both new and the same like all at the same time right is every year I would teach them all the theory about it. And like, these are the three things you need to start a fire. This is the thing. And I always ended the theory bit with like, fuses do not work. And you must not have a flat pile of objects because they won't start on fire. And without fail, every time, there's at least one kid I walk over because I, I hold the matches. They're not allowed to have them until. Fire, yes. So I walk over and I'm like, all right, tell me where you're going to put the match. And they're like, I'm going to put it here or there, like whatever. And some of them like, I'm like, all right, here's the match. Show me how you're going to do it. And some of them will just like put the match into the ground. And you're like, all right, let's talk about why maybe that isn't going to work. And they're like, you know, what, what happens when you do that? And then you, you walk them through it and they're like, oh, okay. And then they are going to do it the right way. But without fail, one of them's like, and I'm going to light this fuse. And I'm like, what did we say about fuses? And they're like, fuses don't work. I'm like, <laughs> immediately after cool. we're going to do this. Yeah, yeah, but like they would repeat the theory back to me. Like yes. they knew I had told them this wasn't going to work. And I was like, so what do you have? They're like, a fuse. I'm like, so? And they're like, I'm going to light it. I'm like, all right, here's your match. <laughs> <laughs> and they light it and it doesn't work. And they're like, I'm like, what do you think happened? They, they look at it and they're like, I don't know. <laughs> like, Let's think about it, and like they'll come to it. They'll be like, "Fuses don't work." You're like, "All right, cool, excellent. I will come back to you later when yes. you don't have a fuse." Um, and then like you walk over to another kid, and he's just got a pile that's flat. And you're like, "All right, the flat piles work." And they're like, "Nope." And I'm like, "What do you have?" They're like, "I mean, it's sort of got some shape to it." And you're like, <laughs> "Okay, all right." And then the same, it's the same thing. But like every year, they find like a new and creative. It's always a fuse in a flat pile, but they find new and creative ways of doing it. Like the you're just like, you walk up and you don't think they have a fuse, and then the kid's like, and then my fuse is over here, and you're like, God dang it! <laughs> you were so close! Yeah. And, but, like, you, I, I think you find the same thing in classrooms, where it's, like, it's on a different scale, but you have to, like, you have to be ready to deal with that, where, like, there are going to be people, people, like, I have taught them the theory. They repeat the theory back to me, so clearly... It's there somewhere. Yeah, they know <laughs> what they're doing, but they're just, like, it hasn't clicked for them, and, like, understanding... One, learning to, like, find that is funny and not just, like, deeply, deeply frustrated. Yeah. Um, and then, two, learning how to, like, be like, okay, so you know the words, but they haven't, like, they've formed no meaning for you. And, like, how do you do that? And, like, you find it in every classroom you go into where there's always something where it's, like, this is the one concept where you're going to tell them, and they're going to repeat it back to you, and they're going to have no idea what, what they're saying. What actually means. Um, and it, it happened in controls where like I taught them stuff and I was like, this is how you do it. And they're like, this is how we do it. And then we gave them a problem on the exam. And they're like, we didn't know how to do that. And I was like, uh. Oh, but you did though. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I will teach it better. And it's like taking the onus as an instructor to be like, all right, if you didn't get it, that is not your failing as a student. No. I did not explain this in a way that makes sense to you. And I will now add this to my list of things that every time I come back to this class or come back to this concept, I need to teach it one the way I originally did, and then two, this new way. And every time you do it, there's hopefully fewer new ways that you have to do it. But sometimes it's just this building list of like, 
everybody's going to come in and every year there's going to be a new form. It's a different kind of DEI, but there's always a new form of diversity that just doesn't understand what you're saying, regardless of how many ways you say it. Yeah. And learning to learning to not get frustrated by that and like accept that as like the fun challenge of teaching as opposed to the negative outcome, I think is is really important. Kind of tying into like DEI, like how does that kind of play a role into like the mental checklist of like, oh, I need to go through problems X, Y, Z way. Like, um, how have you kind of experienced that in the classroom or not experienced in the classroom? Or like, um, if you could speak to that, I guess. Yeah. So the, I have not run into, I mean, I've had diversity like within my classrooms, but I have not had to, um, change a lot in response to it or i haven't been prompted to change a lot maybe some of that is just like me speaking from a, a point of blindness um when you say diversity um, what are you directly referring to um like race and gender like okay. visible diversity i haven't none of my classrooms and like most of my instruction i have not been in a place to like discuss comment on or observe people's like financial means mm -hmm. um so i haven't i haven't had to really interact with that um but it is really common, especially within like engineering, that you will have, you know, international students. So like generally a large Chinese population, generally like a large Indian population. And then you also have like, if you're lucky, a couple girls in your classroom. Uh, but sometimes it's, you know, it's all guys. Um, and I think that's, I, I say like, I think you're lucky if you have like women in your classroom because it is an interesting um, it's like another problem to solve within teaching, right? Like, because typically like a lot of the girls in engineering are some of the smartest in the class. Um, but it is really difficult sometimes to get them one to understand it themselves or two to like display that to others, even if they do understand it themselves. Um, because like there, it's just like, and it's something that I have to be mindful of too. Cause I won't, you know, it's a blindness that like if, you know, I look out at the classroom and five people have their hands up. I may just call on, if, even if I call on a random student, I am, you know, statistically calling on, a, on one of the guys. And, you know, you know, I may like accidentally, and if I don't call on one of the like, female students a couple times, they may stop putting their hand up because they're just like, oh, well, he's ignoring me. It's like, well, I'm not intentionally ignoring you, but like, yeah, that is in effect what's happened here. Um, and so I guess mostly for me where like DEI has like found its way in the classroom is um, identifying my own blind spots and like where where am I not doing as much as I could to like empower people to like do for themselves. Yeah, yeah participate, do for themselves. Um, some of it I worry about a little bit with like, sort of like, I, I have a very like casual teaching style. Um, I tend to not, I don't ask them to like call me by a title or anything. I just like, you know, you can call me my name, it's fine. Um, and I also don't have the strictest control over my language. Um, I Just to say that like, I swear a fair amount during class. Um, but I've, I think that sometimes that can be, with a lot of like, that's another blind spot that I'm, I'm sort of like, thinking back about my like semester teaching mechatronics was really obvious to me because a lot of the, like the white students, uh, especially like, other white, males, right? Like, they're very used to it. Like, it does not bother them if I swear during class. Like, if anything, it sort of, like, um, helps to, like, have a relationship with them because they, they don't be see... be relatable. Like, yeah, you're yeah. not too high up. You're not unattainable, I guess. Or yeah. not un I'm sorry, the phrasing of that was weird. But, like, you're not so far removed from them. Yeah, like, I am somebody they can talk to. Yes. Um, but I think that, like, while doing that, I'm also potentially, like, one, alienating... Uh, international students who likely have never been in a situation. A lot of these students have not been in a situation where their instructor swears before, Yeah. period. Um, but like certainly the, the gap is much smaller for like domestic and then like the closer you get to my particular subset of like, uh, whatever you, there's a word for like, I don't know, I'm cis white male. So the closer oh, we get to I that, see what you're saying. Yes. Okay. the closer we get to people who are like, are like me, the easier it is for them to be gotcha. like, okay with my casualness. And like the further you get from that and like the more culturally removed from it, I think it, it makes it a lot more difficult for people. Um, yeah. Because you have like international students who are 
um, I, from my understanding, like a lot of their um, academic sort of uh, culture has been like very strict or like very like based around like your instructor is going to be this very professional person. Like you're going to have somewhat of a distant relationship with them. And that's really how it like needs or wants to be. Um, and that's not really um, kind of how it is most times here. I mean, you obviously yeah. do get that, but then there's, you know, like the very the more laid back casual kind of approach to it, which I do also. The person that I teach under, she also does that as well. Yeah. And, you know, I think it does help create a very relaxed um, environment. But yes, no, it's being aware that that's not what everybody's used to. Yeah. And so kind of playing that fine line of like, this is who I am. This is the kind of teacher I want to be, but realizing that like maybe that doesn't really look the same to like people from, that have different backgrounds and different perspectives yeah. um, growing up with education styles that aren't like ours. Yeah, and making like trying to be like really cognizant, like not necessarily having to like change your style, but like making sure that the communication is clear that like that does not cause you to be intimidating or like off putting to them. Like it's like you can teach, I guess, in your style, but like. I know, at least for me personally, it's like I need to be able to like very quickly find my blind spots and like make sure that having those is not causing others to be uncomfortable um, or causing them to like feel rejected from the classroom. Um, I also, is it, we're going to get into like an odd topic. Um, as when teaching the seniors, it wasn't uh, so bad because uh, I, it's, it's like very much like I'm on the podium and I'm in the instructor role. And other than, like, office hours, there wasn't a lot of, um, like, one-on-one -on -one interaction with students. Mm. Um, and so that was sort of fine. And, like, I very quickly, like, learned, like, various students' personalities. Like, one of my students, um, I, th I assume he was international. He, see he was, one, he was very shy, but his, his English was maybe, like, a, it seemed like he was fluent, but I don't know. It was just, like, one of those things where, like, it doesn't seem like this is quite your first language. And he was shy and, like... He was really good about coming and asking me questions. He asked really good questions um, and he was very involved. But like when I talked with him, I needed to really slow down. One, like literally just slow down how quickly I spoke. And then two, sort of like dial back my energy a lot um, when I talked with him. And, but that was like very easy to learn and like very easy to work around where like other students, I have a tendency to like, I joke around with them a lot more. Like I had several students where I was on like good enough terms that they would ask me questions during offset and I would just look at them and be like, nope and go back to like whatever it was yeah and they knew that i would come back over and like help them as soon as i had a second like there was no like no offense taken but there was like a lot of like sort of teasing back and forth and like some of the students would like give me a little bit of sass and i'd give them a little bit of sass and it was fine um but it was all guys in office hours mm. um which we only had one girl no that's not true three we had three girls in the class um and they didn't show up to office hours for the most part i I don't know why. <laughs> I don't think anyone told them that this is how I was behaving because it wasn't any different than class, which maybe that's a blind spot. But um, when I taught chem lab, it's all like one to one. Like you're constantly going around the classroom and like you like stand next to people and like you are like interacting with them. Um, and I tried to like run the thin line in between like treating everyone the same and like having my style of communication while also not accidentally fostering inappropriate relationships with students. Yes. Um, especially as like an instructor who's like pretty young um, in violation of them, it's like, I don't want any of my students to like misconstrue anything I'm saying as like me coming onto them. And I also don't want them to like misconstrue that as like, we are casual enough that you can come on to me. Yes. So it's like, please, like, let's not cross that line. Like there was a day when I was doing chem lab which group of girls called me over, not the ones that lit shit on fire, um, different group. Um, <laughs> okay. And they're like, "Have you ever been told you look like so and so?" And it was like, I don't know, some famous person or like someone well known or whatever. Yeah, and I was like, "No," but also I don't. We're like, "Nope," and we're done. You yes. guys can discuss what I look like on your own. I'm gonna go somewhere else. I don't want to be involved in it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And that can be some like a little bit of a. It's an odd line it sometimes. Is. I know I definitely had an issue or not an issue with it when I was first starting. I feel like now I kind of look older. Mm. And so, and I also kind of hold myself differently while still being approachable, but not being, like, we can be friends, but understand there's a line and do not cross it. Yeah. Um, like when 
being 22 years old, TAing students that are, you know, only four years younger than you, they think because you're young that they can just say things and that it's yes. okay. And yeah. it's, it's not. And making that boundary with them and being like, you know, we can be friends to a point. Like yeah. there's, this is still like, I am the like instructor. I'm the person like in charge here. Like you still have to listen because X, Y, Z reason or whatever. But um, no, that is a hard, a weird line. I feel like it doesn't really get talked about enough, but it's a weird line being very young in grad school and then like having to deal with that um, kind of like having a friendly relationship without being too friendly. And even like further back in the conversation, right? We talked about like being empathetic and having like some amount of emotional support for your students. Yes. Like that can be a strange line too, where it's like you want to be friendly with them enough that like they feel like not only can they ask for help academically, but if like they really need help in your course or like something around like where you are in a position to help them, yes, that they're willing to open up about that. And that's, I had a, a conversation with my students one day um, where I came in and I talked about mental health for one of my classes. Cause I, when I was running the mechatronics course, I came in and it was like, I had, I had intended to have this conversation with them before. Cause I was like thinking back to my senior year, which was a mess. Um, emotionally and like in a lot of different ways. Um, and I'd really struggled with depression my senior year and I'd heard a lot of comments from my students sort of like that they had been not made to me, but like made in passing about stuff. Um, that kind of echoed. Yeah. That was like echoing some of those sentiments and then just like the general, like end of your, you know, end of academic career sentiments where it's like, Oh, if I don't pass this class, like I've never gotten below a B before. I can't, I can't possibly get a C. I will fail like my job that I have lined up will suddenly reject the offer, like all this stuff. And like, where you just like crazy stress yourself out about things. Um, and so I came in and had a discussion with them one day, but I had to like preempt my discussion. I was like, I'm gonna talk about a bunch of stuff. Um, but just so you know, and I was like, you know, when we're done, you can come talk to me. You can tell me anything you want, but so you're aware, I am legally bound to report some things. Yes. And I was like, here are, here are other people that you can talk to that are not legally bound to report what you are saying. But if you come to talk to me as an instructor, I'm unfortunately like contractually and legally Obligated tied to, yeah. Yeah, to, to report these. So like, I'm going to tell you guys all these things, um, but like, you need to understand that like, this is the line and it's not even like a soft line that we can bend. Like it's going to be, yeah. please don't tell me that you're about to commit suicide because I am going to have to report that. Um, yes. It's like, please don't, please talk to someone. Yes. And we had a, like, that was a, sort of like the whole point of my conversation was like, I, I told them about a lot of my experiences and how I felt. And I was like, I didn't talk to anybody. And I was like, if you feel this way, like if you are feeling these feelings and you're not talking to anybody, and I know that a lot of you are not like voicing this and like the whole like Robin William effect is like, you know, if you think your friend might feel this way, or if you feel this way, like it's not normal. Like you shouldn't yeah. feel these things. Like you, like, please talk to somebody if this is like where you're at. Um, and that was a really interesting experience. Cause one, after that, I had a student approach me and for like the rest of the semester, we met like somewhat regularly, like weekly or bi-weekly. And it was just, it wasn't about the class. He just like came and talked to me. He's like, yeah, this is how my senior year is going. And like, you know, this, this bit's a mess or that bit's a mess. And like ended up being really helpful, I think for him. And I definitely like felt there was a, there was a shift in tone in the class and like how students perceived me after that, where there's like, really like, I had been like casual before and like, they're like, oh, he's like a cool professor guy. And then like, after that, I was like, oh, he's a no, he's like person. Yeah. yeah. This is like, this is an actual person in front of us, not just like an instructor. Yeah. Um, you mentioned like a textbook on legs, like the yeah. first time we talked and I was like, no, we are more than that. Like we are, we are human. We have real things that happen in our real lives. Yeah. You'll see us at the grocery store don't have a panic attack. Like <laughs> I'm just getting eggs or milk or whatever. Like calm yeah, down. Eggs. <laughs> yeah. A whole other topic for a whole other podcast, but yeah. no, like I'm glad that you had that conversation and making, um, resources known. I feel like as a grad student, it, we'll get back to the teaching aspects of this, but even as like a grad student, I didn't realize like how many um, resources that we had within the grad school, mm -hmm. like that are just there for us. Yeah. And it's a weird thing to be like, why is nobody talking about this? Like, why aren't we told of these resources like outright so that, you know, we can get help or if we're interested in this thing, we can take a class on it or, yeah. you know, talk to professors that actually do X, Y, Z that we want to do when we get out of here. And, 
you know, like mental health resources. Like, why do we not make this more of a common conversation? Right. Um, and in classes, like, um, I, I think it's so important. And I'm glad that I really am glad that you did. And like resource wise, because we do that a lot with our in, in our freshman class, uh, 10, 10, 14. And yeah. we make them like we have uh, reflections that we do every week, mm -hmm. which is very different than like a lot of other classes. But it's very much geared towards like mental health, your support system. Like it's all we talked about having assignments like that maybe for grades, but like it's all like for participation. Like so long as yeah, you yeah. do it, like, you know, you don't have to necessarily um, you like you get a hundred. Right. Want. Exactly. It's only going to benefit you at the end of the day, if you want to divulge whatever information you want to divulge. Right. But one of the things that we talk about is our bridges. Like, we are a bridge. We have a lot of things on our bridge. Like, mm -hmm. and drawing out like, oh, do you have this assignment that's coming up that's really weighing on you? Are you having like family issues, financial issues? Like, how can we help you get those things off the bridge? Or like, how do yeah. we help ourselves do those? Uh, like, how do we help ourselves so that we're not having a bridge that's going to collapse, right? Because we have too much on it and making those resources known. So having that open dialogue, even though, yes, it's not like it's pertinent to the course. Mm -hmm. Like, I think it's pertinent to just being a person, like yeah. to being a caring person and knowing that students go through a lot, like having been one, you know, yeah. currently being one, like, yeah. <laughs> you know? So um, I think in, in relation to the bridge too, like, making sure that students are like putting appropriate weights on things. Like that was one of the yes. things I touched on is like, you know, yeah, you want to get good grades and yes, I want you to do well in my class. But like, if you are killing yourself to get an A, this is not worth it. No, this is not the, like, this is not the time to kill yourself for that letter. Like if you are killing yourself to get an A, get a B. If you're yeah. killing yourself to get a B, get a C. If you're killing yourself to get a C, please come talk to me. Yes. Um, <laughs> Maybe it's time to look lessen the coursework. Like, if that's what's going to happen, like, yeah. being well-rounded is not a problem. Like, and I think that's something that a lot of students nowadays, like, they're like, I need to get a perfect GPA because I need to get into this med school or, yeah. like, all these things are writing on my GPA. But at the end of the day, like, a GPA, hot take here, only says how much you spend on classes. Like, how much time you put into each class. Yeah. But I remember sitting down with, like, a physical chemistry teacher and I was like, why am I not getting this? Like, why I'm trying to put all this effort and time into it? And we literally sat there in his office and wrote out everything that I was doing other than his class. Mm -hmm. And he was like, my class is three credits. You need to be studying 12 hours. And like feasibly, I did not have 12 hours between all of like the things and classes I was like right. in. Yeah. And it just comes down to that. Like having an honest conversation with somebody that's like in that position to be like, Hey, like I understand where you're coming from, but also here's the reality. Like you can you can't live Yeah. You need to you need to live in the reality of the situation because you're going to bog yourself down with problems that like yeah. it's And as professors or like instructors being very clear about like wanting them to succeed in your area but not impressing upon them the belief that your class is the most important thing in their yes. life. I mean yes. like Look, I want you to do well at this. I'd really like if you spent the time to get A's. I'd really like if you all got A's. But, like, if you have other shit that is more important than this, you have other shit that's more important yeah. than this. Like, sometimes, like, deadlines line up with each other. Sometimes things need to be put on the back burner because you need to do one thing or another. Like, it happens. Like, yeah. we, again, we're real people. We understand that this balancing act needs to happen. Um, and just impressing that upon them and, like, making sure that that's known that's real life when you go to a job there's going to be deadlines that take precedent over one thing or another like yeah or maybe it's a matter of better balancing your time and being like i'm only going to spend x amount of hours on this thing and then move forward yeah. like there's a million and three ways to to do it it's a matter of like getting to that point that works for you um, yeah and i feel like as a teacher like you can't teach somebody how to do that like they just have to live through that but making it known that, and understanding that like this is something we all do yeah. this is something like you can teach some skills around that though and that's something i've run into a couple times is like it's amazing to me it was always with seniors they've gotten to this point where actually it's it's been seniors and a couple grad students that have said these like words to me they were like they won't tell somebody they're failing until they have already passed the point of no return and it's like like i, I was actually having a conversation with a, a 
incoming grad student to tech who's who's doing a project um and he was saying you know I, I don't think i can meet this deadline what should i do about it and he's like should i just wait until like the a week before and then tell him i was like why and like you are a month out from that deadline why would you wait three more weeks to let them know that you're you're struggling like do it now and like teaching students that as well where it's like don't wait until you were failing my class to come talk to me don't wait until the assignment was already due to come talk to me don't wait until there's only 24 hours to finish a project that i gave you two weeks on to come talk to me like as soon as you think you might have problems say it then yeah come talk to us like we like i can do so much more for you at the start than i can you know minutes before the deadline and maybe you don't ever like if you come to me and you're like i don't think i'm gonna hit this deadline here's why we can talk about that and then if you do hit the deadline you've lost nothing like i and like getting students and people in general to like the point of understanding like you have not lost my respect by admitting you... that you were struggling like you have if anything you've gained my respect by being willing to admit that you might have problems even if you never encounter those problems like that's that's so much more productive and so much better to do yes um touching back on your experience kind of being more of a mentor to that student that was having maybe um, a harder time with their semester and meeting like bi-weekly, weekly and whatnot. Um, that's like an extra type of mentorship that we don't normally see with teaching. Um, could you speak to your experience as a mentor or um, maybe mentors that um, have kind of paved the way for you and how you mentor and um, anything uh, speaking, speaking to that and mentorship? Sure, um, so I think like for that student specifically, I, I don't know that that's, it's hard for me to say that that's something that I would, it's certainly something that I would do again. Like put in the same position, I would I would 100% run it back the exact same. Um, and I'd be more than happy to be a mentor like that for just about any student. Like there's still a few of my students now after the class has ended, um, other than, than that guy who have come to me and like asked about their path through grad school um, and stuff like that. But I don't know that I would necessarily tie it to teaching. Um, I think I was in a position to be like available as a mentor because I was a teacher. Like I, that put me in front of the student and like gave me that uh, that opportunity. But it's not something that I would expect to do as an instructor, right? Like a lot of the students, I because I'm also we mentioned it very briefly in the in the intro. Um, I'm part of the mechanical engineering graduate student. Uh, Council? Yeah, there's the C. MEGSC. Um, I'm, I'm currently president for that, but I've also, I've been involved in it uh, prior to this year. Um, and as part of that, I, I have like a sort of a large mentoring role for the whole department. Yeah. Um, and so that I'm sort of like primed, especially for students who are interested in grad school to be a mentor for that um, because of my other roles outside of instructing. Um, and so I, that's, why I'm very okay with like students coming in, like asking with me about grad students. But I don't know that like necessarily like if I was an instructor and not in those roles, that I would be the right person to do that. Um, but as far as like being a mentor in general, some of the like, some of the really influential people um, that I've had, I had a couple of the adult leaders when I was in Boy Scouts that were like very influential in sort of like how to be a leader and how to teach. And one of the like the best things they did to me was that a lot of them led very softly um there was a lot of like i i wasn't i was very rarely reprimanded in front of other people even if i did stuff like pretty wrong um they would pull me off on the side after i'd messed up in front of the new scouts and be like hey let's talk about how we're not gonna do that again, again. Yeah. um and but like it was a really great form of like soft leadership where i was never even sometimes on rare occasion was i told straight up like hey you were wrong like you done you done messed up um most of the time it was more of like i was asked questions and like led to sort of analyze my actions myself and they were just there like as somebody who had already made or witnessed those mistakes and like knew how to analyze them and they like so it taught me a lot about how to one analyze my own actions but two how to teach others to do the same um so in leadership and that's sort of like i think that's also part of like why i try to have like a very empathetic classroom is that like the more conversation you're willing to have just in general like the better learning gets because people learn either to analyze themselves their own actions or like learn to analyze the problems that you're teaching in class and stuff like that if there's more conversation um 
And then as far as like teaching style goes, I've had a couple of, I don't necessarily like model my style of teaching after them, but I've had a couple of teachers that were like really stand out as like truly wonderful educators. Um, my high school calculus teacher, Miss Lester was one of them. She was sort of like a force in and of herself as part of my high school is Western. Um, what's the name of it? So like at Western High School, um, you knew every student in Western High School knows who Miss Lester is. Some of the middle schoolers know who Miss Lester is, and everyone lives in fear of Miss Lester um, because there's just like there's there's this thing of, like you're told before you enter your her class like Miss Lester will eat you. Um, and she was like, she was a big woman. Like she was a, she used to be like a D1 basketball player and she still lifted weights. Like she was, she was a force to be reckoned with both like academically and just in general, like if you met her in a dark alley, your best bet was probably running. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like your first day of class, you would walk in and she was going to be, if you had pre-calc with Miss Lester, that was going to be the last math teacher you had for your high school career. And you would walk into her class and she'd let you know what she was about on day one. Um, or she gave this speech every year, which was like, I don't care what you're doing outside of this class. I don't care, you know, if you're a good student, if you're a bad student, I don't care if like something is like going wrong, which was weird to hear. So like, she totally did care if you were still outside the classroom. Um, but she was like, she's like, I don't care anything else. I don't care if you want to or not, but for 15 minutes a day, you're going to succeed. I don't care if I have to drag you kicking and screaming for 50 minutes a day, you will succeed. And that was just like, that was what Miss Lester was about. And she was like, that's how she ran her classroom. And she expected you to be present in her classroom. She expected you to like answer questions when she asked them to the class and not just like one person. Like she wanted the whole class to answer questions for her. And like, she expected you to like take, um, take responsibility for your work. All of our work in her course was like self-graded and you pretty much, if you did the homework, you got the points for the homework. That's was, was really what it was. Um, but you had to do the homework and she was like, so long as you did it, she was very lenient on like what you got wrong or didn't get right. And like still giving you credit for the attempt. But if you didn't do it, if you didn't take that initial responsibility, oh boy, yeah. she was not going to have it with you. And like, if you came to her with problems, she was there to solve them with you. And like, she was going to help you succeed. Whatever you needed, she was going to help you succeed. But if you didn't come to her and you messed up and then you just told her, you're like, or heaven forbid, you didn't tell her, you just like messed up and tried to keep it quiet. Oh man, man, mercy on your soul. Miss <laughs> Lester did not want to have anything to do with that. Um, but it, it set up like a really great example, I think, of like what it means for an instructor to be um, like dedicated to their role. Yeah. Right. Like it's not necessarily the style like that. I want, I don't want to like be intimidating the way Miss Lester was intimidating, but for sure, like everyone respected Miss Lester, whether you liked her or not, you had to respect what she was doing because she was so dedicated and so consistent to it. Like she told you what she was about and she didn't deviate from that. Right. Um, Having expectations of your instructor and them of you, and then everybody kind of holding to the expectations. Like that's an important thing. You know, we don't yeah. want wishy-washy teaching. We don't want wishy-washy people, yeah. you know? Um, and it was, so I, I really enjoyed that. I had another professor or another instructor in high school who taught chemistry. Um, I took Chem 1 with him, which was a required course, and then I took Chem 2, which was sort of like mechatronics. You were there if you wanted to be there. Um, and I think without realizing that's a lot of I taught mechatronics was sort of like how he taught his class. Um, where it's like we showed up every day and like he wanted to learn. He wanted us to learn. Like he wanted to teach us stuff, but he was very much like, if we have to go back over this assignment, we'll just go back over it again because right. literally whatever you walk out of it, and he said it multiple times, he's like, I can't teach this as AP, so there's no test for you to pass at the end. There's no college credit writing for you. Like, just so you guys know, like, you're just here so that you have a little bit of extra knowledge when you leave this classroom. Yeah. And that's how he ran it. He was just like, if we need to go back over something so it's extra solid, then that's what we'll do because that's the importance of this. And um, he was also just like a really entertaining guy. And lots of good stories. Um, I think that's another thing. I all the instructors that I've enjoyed the most um, have had good stories. And like that's not something you like. You can't teach that, but like, man, does that just make class so much more interesting when like your instructor is willing to break from whatever they're talking about? And she's like, you know what? This one time, I and my friends in the '40s when we were children decided that the best thing to do would be to put somebody 
inside of an old truck tire. <laughs> and, then, and then we would push him down the hill. And it was the best. And it was like, he would tell stories like this all the time. Like, I've had other instructors who did sort of stories like this. And it, was, it just makes class so much more fun. And it, like, rewards you for paying attention, right? Yes. Because if you're zoned out, you miss the story. Like, you only tune back in when everybody's laughing. You're like, what I miss? Um, so it's, it's sort of like its own soft incentive. It's that, it's that soft leadership again where it's like, you're not penalized for doing wrong. You're just rewarded for doing right. And when you do wrong, you're, like, guided back to whatever's correct or, like, to better, right? And I think that sort of guides a lot. The other, the only other professor I really want to touch on is um, my Calc 3 instructor. Calc 2 instructor is hilarious, but it's besides the point. Kenji taught, like, I got to do it now. Um, my Calc 1 and 2 professor, his name was uh, Kenji. I don't remember what his last name was. Um, but he talked like this for the entire, there was just his voice. So it wasn't like he put on a voice. He just talked like stitch constantly. Oh my and gosh. so I learned Calc 1 and 2 like this. And he would also, um, in the middle of class, he would like, we would be doing the like change of rate problems where it's okay. like, oh, you have to like fill a cylinder or yes. whatever, like fill a cone, like how quickly is it filling? And he'd be like, okay, we will fill the cone with water. And then, so we're going to do this. And you will say, but Kenji, this is boring and you won't pay attention. So I, okay, I will put a stick figure in it and we will fill the water. And so he will drown. But you'll say, Kenji, this is not interesting. He will just swim to the top. And say, okay. So I will tie him to the bottom, and then we will figure out when he dies. <laughs> you're just like, it's like, it, it's like, you know, somebody goes back to like, when am I going to use this again? Or it's yeah. like, I, I don't know when I'm going to use change of rate problems to fill a car with water, but I am for sure invested in this problem now. Yes. Um, <laughs> Absurdities, but making it interesting. Yeah, yes. yeah. So I, he was fantastic in that. And then my Calc 3 professor, uh, Ben Wiles, what a G. Um, I don't, it, it wasn't anything, I can't point to what he did that was spectacular, but we just loved him. He was just like a fantastic instructor. And then he was, I think part of the, what made him great is that like, he, he would come in on Fridays and he always would like pull up like a one, what's the YouTube channel? I don't know what it is, but he would like pull up videos that were just like interesting. They're like, hey, this is like really weird math stuff, but like we're gonna like look at this video about like really cool tessellations. Um, and he was just like, he would just like bring in his interest as they pertain to the class and just like, we're just gonna look at an interesting thing that has nothing to do with this. You don't have to learn, you don't have to like listen if you don't want, but I think it's cool. And so like, I'm gonna share what's cool, or what I think is cool with you. Um, and I think that was probably a part of like building that relationship when we all just like loved him. And at the end of the semester, um, we wrote up on the board before he walked into class one day, like Ben Wiles for Supreme Ruler of the Universe. <laughs> um, <laughs> and he came in and he erased universe and just like wrote in multiverse. And like the whole oh class, God, <laughs> the whole class lost their shit. We're just like, <laughs> it was like a lecture hall of 200 people. Um, Listen, that's a bold, that's a bold thing to do. Like, it's yeah. like, no, I want it all. Yeah, but he was, like, <laughs> it was just, it was sort of, like, acknowledging our absurdity and, like, just very quietly meeting us on that level and just being, like, he didn't have to stand up there and, like, be incredibly casual. Like, he was just very much himself, but he could, he still met us at our level when given the opportunity. I thought that was really cool. No, that is. That, all fascinating, like, stories and people. Yeah. And I can see why, you know, their teaching or their mentorship or any of that, like, kind of, like it's all pot like it's all positive it's all like could be seen in like who i think of as good teachers right now like they all kind of have aspects of what you brought up yeah so no like we all could use a positive role model like a teacher that's encouraging a teacher that's no bullshit like miss miss luster like yeah. we all need somebody like that in our life to be like no that person believed in me like yes she was extremely like you know not cutthroat, but like she extremely hard lined about, about it. But yeah. like, you know, she was there. Like she she was in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like there was a there was a Calc three professor that I had that was very very much like that. But like at the end of the day, like she wanted you to succeed, and mm -hmm. like she was here for it. So yeah. No, I think uh, very riveting conversations and a lot that has been said. So thank you so much for joining us today and for giving your perspective and. 
Yeah. Telling us all about you and your teaching. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And thank you for tuning in today. Um, I'm sure we'll have another episode soon. So.